it's okay not to be okay. It's okay not to be okay. And I will spend the next uh, few minutes looking at um, mental health issues, what to do so that we can cushion ourselves from uh, getting into mental health, getting mental health issues, what to do as a family if we have uh, a member that is um, living with a mental illness, and also how to respond as a church. And you know, sometimes when we talk about uh, mental health issues, what comes to mind for most people is that they think mental illness is, uh, you know, being crazy or being mad. So already in their mind, people normally would think of, um, you know, that person who is walking with the tattered, dirty clothes and maybe they are mad, as we call it. But then we are going to see that mental illness is actually a, a range of conditions. Now, former Miss USA and TV personality Chesley Christ died by suicide on Sunday, 30th, January 22, 2022. She was the age of 30 years. Uh, Christ was an attorney who sought to help reform America's justice system. She was a fashion blogger and an, an entertainment news correspondent. She was crowned Miss USA in 2019. She died after jumping from a building. Before her death, she posted on an Instagram photo of herself, and the caption was, may this day bring you rest and peace. And so this girl, this lady you can even check online, who seemed to have everything going for her, she was what we can call beauty, brains and finances because everything was looking up she commits a suicide 30th of january 2022 just this year yesterday we said that about a quarter of adolescents and even adults they struggle with mental health issues what does the word of god say when it comes to issues of mental health or diseases of the mind and I would like us to read from the book of Isaiah, chapter 26 and verse 3. Isaiah chapter 26 and verse 3. If you found it, I will read in your hearing, and it says, You will keep him in perfect peace, him whose mind is steadfast because he trusts in you. The Bible says you will keep him in perfect peace, him whose mind is steadfast, because he trusts in you. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for yet another opportunity to hear your word. I pray that you use me one more time to speak to your people. This is a real issue affecting us as individuals, as families, and as a church, and even as a society. Sometimes we don't even know how to respond when we have somebody affected and afflicted by mental illness. I pray that you may speak to us tonight, O oh Lord. You may quicken our understanding. As difficult as the topic may be, I pray that you alone will guide us and lead us deeper into this understanding. Use me now like you have done before, for it's in Jesus' name we pray and believe. Amen, amen, amen. So talking about mental illness, I'm going to ask a few questions to the people who are here, but also even if you're watching us from home, you can participate in the questions. Now, how many people seated here today have experienced death of a family member? And when I say death of a family member, I mean a mother, a father, a child, a husband, a wife, a brother, or a sister. That's what I'm talking about. Let me see. Please stand up. If you have experienced death of a family member, please stand up. I, I know this is something we are sure. I mean, we don't need to rethink, yeah? Okay, please remain standing. How many of us who are seated, if you are standing, you keep on standing. How many people who are seated here who have experienced a miscarriage or an abortion? As a family, you have experienced either a miscarriage or an abortion. 
Okay? If you have experienced, please rise up. Next question. How many people here have been diagnosed with a, a chronic illness, either yourself or a family member? An illness that at some point you actually saw that death is a reality. Maybe it's cancer, maybe it's some other condition, you or a family member, a serious uh, or chronic illness, that at some point you doubted, you said, okay, death is actually a reality. Anybody please stand up? There is a reason why I'm doing this. Okay, and the next question, how many, oh good, how many people have failed a major exam? And I'm saying failed in context because there are no failures, but you have done a major exam and by all standards, you feel you failed the exam according to you. Not even what people are saying, but for you, honestly, you just felt that exam, I failed. Please remain standing. How many people here Continue standing, and if you are standing and you are saying yes, continue standing. How many people here have experienced parental separation or divorce? Your parents have separated or they have divorced, and you have experienced it. Please stand up and remain standing. You have experienced parental divorce or separation. The next question, how many people have been betrayed by somebody you love. Somebody has cheated on you, they have jilted you. You loved them, but they have left you. They left you, whether it's in marriage, they have betrayed you, they have had an affair, they have had a relationship, or they have left you. Continue standing, let's be honest. Now, the other question that I want to ask, how many people here have been attacked by robbers? You have been robbed. Stand up, and if you're standing, remain standing. You have been attacked by robbers. Stand up or remain standing. Now, I want you to turn and look at the people who are standing, and you will realize about 90%, about 90 of us have gone through a major traumatic life experience. Now, I'm going to ask, of the people who are standing, how many people have ever reached out for help? Either from a counselor, psychologist, psychiatrist, pastor, you have reached out to someone seeking mental health services like, please, I need help, I'm struggling with this. If you have sought for help, any form of help, coach, mentor, counselor, pastor, whatever, remain standing. If you haven't, sit down. If you have reached out to someone specifically, you're like, you know what? I need help from this condition. Remain standing. If you haven't, sit down. Now, turn and look. Out of the people that stood who have gone through a potentially tra traumatic event, only about 10% have reached out to someone for help. Thank you so much. Sit down. Now, I want to let you know that mental illnesses are so pervasive. And yet sometimes we have no language for mental illness. What we have gone through, the questions I've asked, these are events that are likely to lead to mental illnesses. According to the World Health Organization, they show that one in every 10 Kenyan, one in every 10 Kenyan suffers from a mental illness. One in every 10 Kenyan. So if I count the people here, if maybe we are 100, 10 of us suffer from a mental illness. Sadly, about half of Kenyans don't have access to mental health services. We have no access. Right now, if somebody is mentally sick, we don't even know where to refer them to. We don't know. Other than maybe they're saying, Aenda Umbewe, some people are taken to a witch doctor, we don't know where to take them. Sad. For every one mentally ill person, four people are affected. For every one mentally ill person, they affect four people. Meaning if in the family, like I'm, maybe if I'm living with a mental illness, I will affect my children and my husband. So those are actually like five people for me. So I'm saying minimum, 
One mentally ill person will affect four people. So do you realize that all of us are either affected or afflicted or something we really cannot say that mental illness is, is, is away from us, that you know, we cannot or we are not suffering from mental illnesses. But really, what's mental illness? That's the question. There is no health without mental health. What's mental illness? Mental illness can be defined as a wide range of conditions that affect the mood. The mood, your thinking, and your behavior. Do you know that many people live with family members who have mental illnesses and they dismiss it as moody? They just say, you know, many times I've had people saying, do you know, wanawake wanakwanga too moody. You know, you just think people are moody, but actually it's a mental illness that needs to be treated. And examples of mental illness are like anxiety, depression, bipolar, eating disorders, personality disorders, post-traumatic stress disorders, psychosis, schizophrenia, and many others. Maybe commonly you might say depression, anxiety, people experience. There's a time I visited a close friend of mine. I was in college that time. I visited her, and I noticed that the father had a mental illness. It looked like I didn't have the language to describe, but I noticed something. Anytime we were in the house, he used to lock the doors. He could go lock all the doors. The father used to work in the police force. So he had, uh, I think he was still that time a police officer. And uh, I think there was a report that was shared in the media about the high rate of mental illnesses among the police force. And I think we can see that because we see a lot of, I think the government is doing something, but we see a lot of shootings and killings and everything. And people are suffering from mental illnesses. So the father used to lock the doors, lock the doors. One day, he locked the door and they could not find the keys. They were all there in the house. You wake up and there's no key. And they panicked. They started crying because they were like, if there's a, a fire breaks out, how do you escape? He, so me, I looked and I just told her, I, there's something off about your dad. And when it comes to time for prayer, he would say, let's pray, let's pray. And he needed us to pray urgently. Then one of the sisters would say, uh, let this program end on the TV. He could get so agitated and even break the TV. You know, no, we have to pray, we have to pray. And they're saying, no, we will pray. Daddy. And he would get agitated, he breaks the TV. And sometimes when he's leaving, like he's going somewhere, he would lock the door, walk, come back, check whether the, the door is locked. Lock the door, come back, keep coming back. And if he goes to wash his hands, he will wash, wash, rewash, go back and wash, go back and wash. So I told her, I have you ever considered that your father could be mentally sick? She said, yes, actually. When my dad was working in a certain area, one time my mother was called that he was seated in a shopping center somewhere. He had sat there the whole night. So she said the mother went, picked him, and they said he has been bewitched. And they took him to a witch doctor. The witch doctor did what, what, what? And they assumed he has gotten well. So, but then now, you know, it was very difficult for them to understand what's happening. Fast forward, he retired, and he became very religious. And I just want to share something. One of the signs of mental illness is people become very religious. They become obsessed with religion. So he became very religious. And people thought that this man is very committed in the word of God and everything. And he was opening churches. In fact, he even opened a church in their compound. Do you get what I'm saying? In their compound, he he started a church in their compound. So you, they, my friend would tell me that every time you would um, go home, you, he says, come, come, let's go to church and pray. You go to the church, you pray. You come home, you've just packed your things, you've washed your hands, you want to eat, come, come, let's go to the church and pray. You go to the church, you pray. Every five minutes, he kept going to the church to pray. And he planted churches everywhere and he did things. And you know, people would look at him and say, the man is so given to the things of God. Unfortunately, he continued living with that untreated mental illness. It brought other conditions because he was always anxious and having a lot of panic. He died of a heart attack. 
prematurely, I think, in my view. So when I think now, because a lot of these things, they became clear to me much later, because at that time I didn't also understand very well. I got to understand because of the anxiety he had all the time. It actually affected the heart in many conditions. And my friend used to tell me that in the night, he would go to the bathroom like every five minutes. Every five minutes, the people in the home could not even sleep because, and the, you know, the bathroom was outside. So every five minutes, washroom, that's what I mean. You know, every five minutes, he would open, he's going, open, he's going. So the mother is asking, what are you going to do? He said, I need to use the washroom. I need to use the washroom every five minutes. So he would end up not sleeping. He had anxiety, panic attacks, untreated mental illness. There are many people walking around with untreated mental illnesses. They affect their families, they affect their children, and they also die prematurely because the mental illnesses are not treated. So what I will do, I will share warning signs. Warning signs of a mental illness. How can you tell? Because we have seen from the word of God that we are meant to have, God will keep us in perfect peace. Because mental illness robs you of your peace. So what are some of the warning signs that somebody could be living with mental illness? Some of them, again, I'm saying some of them, not all. If somebody is excessively paranoid, they are always thinking there's somebody after them. Somebody is going to be after them. Like in this case, I gave the example, the father was always locking doors. Always locking doors. Locking doors every time. He would not stay in the house without a locked door. Nanimchana, excessive paranoid or worry or anxiety. Somebody is very anxious, they are very worried, they are panicked all the time. It may be a sign of a mental illness. The second one is if somebody has long-lasting sadness. Long-lasting. For the time you can remember them, they are more sad than happy. We are not supposed to be more sad than happy. The mom happy moment should be more than the sad moment. Somebody has long-lasting sadness or they are very irritable. Their fuse is very short. You do something, they spark. You do something, they spark on you. You know, you, you worry because they are like a minefield. You step, another explosive device erupts. They are mentally ill. Another one is extreme changes in mood. Extreme changes in mood. One moment, they are smiling and bubbly. The next moment... They are so down. You can't explain what has happened. So extreme changes in mood, sign of mental illness. Another one is social withdrawal. The ambassadors asked one of them, question somebody asked was if I'm antisocial. If you find somebody withdrawing, maybe your home as a family, this child, this teen wants to stay in their room. We are wired for connection. Our desire is to interact with the others. We said, I told the ambassadors, that even God um, exists in, in, in his best. I don't know whether it's right to say that, but God exists in, 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 in companionship. The, the Bible says, God said, let us create, let us create God in our own image. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So God exists in communion or companionship. Then God created us to have a relationship with him. That's why it's very problematic when people say, after all that I did, I was committed in church and everything. This is what God can do to me. It's like you're not in a relationship. You're looking at God like, what can I get? It is a relationship that even when there are moments that are sad, moments are happy, we fail, we pass exams, still God is with you. You remember the story of Moses? When Moses was being sent to Egypt, have you ever thought about it? And Moses is telling God, I stammer. I cannot communicate properly. Don't you think it was very easy for God to wave a magic hand or wand or potion? Anyway, God was just going to say a word. And Moses was going to have perfect speech. Don't you think so? Was it going to be difficult? The God who said, who said and breathed and the man came to life. He would just say, Moses, thou shalt be whole. And Moses would be very eloquent. But you know what God told Moses? I will be with you. He did not remove the imperfection in the speech. He just says, I will be with you. So no matter what we go through, God has promised to be with us, not to remove, you know, the thorns and thistles and rocks and bumps and whatever on the way, but God will be with you. 
this is important for young people. Even when you fail, you pass, you are betrayed, you are attacked by robbers, God will be with you. Okay? So, if somebody is withdrawing and they are saying, ah, me, I'm introverted. Mm -mm, mm -mm. You may want to spend some time alone, but also it shouldn't be that you always want to withdraw. You find somebody who used to come to church, they no longer feel like coming to church. They just see people and they are walking, they don't want to be seen. That's why I keep telling young people this story of covering yourself with a hoodie and you're in Kisumu and it's so hot. You know, are you, is there a statement? I keep asking my kids, is there a statement you want to pass? Please communicate, you know? So it's important to know if somebody is socially withdrawing, it may be a sign of a mental illness because we are wired for connection. Another one is if there are dramatic changes in eating or sleeping. Somebody used to have a good appetite, they are no longer wanting to eat. Somebody is eating too much or somebody is sleeping, oversleeping, or somebody remains awake, like they are awake. They are not sleeping, they are awake one day, two days, maybe a sign of a mental illness. So if there's a change in sleeping pattern, you sleep, you leave them awake. You wake up, you find them asleep. Or they just want to sleep day and night, they're just sleeping. That is a problem. Now, the other sign I would like to share is if there's a drug or substance use. I tell parents this way. It is not usual for a child or a teenager or whatever to just start taking drugs or alcohol use. Usually, they are running away from pain or they want to find pleasure. So there is usually the pain. And if we focus on that, that, oh, we are taking away the alcohol. I remember uh, President Uhuru did something that I think the intention was good when all the alcohol was poured in um, central Kenya because of the young people who are being wasted in alcohol. They took the alcohol, they poured it. It didn't work because you have not dealt with the underlying issue. There's a reason as to why these young people are waking up every day and they are going to drink and they are going to look for that alcohol. So we need to deal with the root cause. What is the pain? Why are you in pain? You know, why are you seeking pleasure? What's making you want to seek pleasure? So when you see that somebody is given into drug, substance abuse, there's a likelihood of them uh, struggling with a mental health issue. So having shared the warning signs, I want to share how can we prevent ourselves? Because as we have seen, 90% of us, we have gone through traumatic experiences that are likely to lead to a mental illness. Yes, in terms of mental illness, there is usually a genetic component, but our lifestyle triggers. And then, so we, say, we normally say genetics load the gun, lifestyle is the trigger. And lifestyle includes even the experiences that we go through that are beyond our choice. And can I say even those who remain seated, I want to assure you of one thing, you will go through one of the things that we have shared, even if it's losing a family member. At some point, we will all lose family members. Yeah, It may happen later, but we will. So we will all, without exception, go through an experience that is likely to trigger mental illness. That's why this topic is important for us to be forewarned so that we are forearmed. So the preventive behaviors, I will share qu quickly 10 of them. And maybe if we have a bit of time, I may share what to do. Uh, you, the preventive behaviors, Think optimistically. Always think of situations as a cup that is half full than half empty. Avoid responding to situations as a victim. Don't always say, you know, they did this to me. You know, they did this to me. How can they do this? You're not a victim. You are a victor. The Bible says you're more than a conqueror. What stories are you telling yourself? Are you looking at your ancestors and looking at yourself and saying, in our family, nobody ever owned a car. In our family, nobody ever did this. In our family, and then you own that as a victim. You are not. You can end the cycle. Number two, develop your self-esteem. Develop your self-esteem. Many people who succumb to mental illnesses, they have a low self-esteem. They think very lowly of themselves. In fact, Ellen White puts it so beautifully that the Lord is disappointed when his people put a low estimate on themselves. The Lord is disappointed when 
His people put a low estimate on themselves because we are more than conquerors. The third one is find support in people. You can have a counselor and you can have Christ. You can have a psychiatrist and a Bible. So don't think that seeking help is not a sign of weakness. Seeking help is not unchristian. In fact, it's Christian. In the Bible, when, the, when Saul, Saul the king was being disturbed, he looked for David. And David would come and sing for him or to him, and he would feel better. So you need a David. All of us need a David. Now, the work is to identify who that community is, because there's community that can actually take you down. Now, the other one is keep yourself active. I don't know how people keep themselves active around here. Exercise. Exercise. It shouldn't be that the only way you keep active is by beating around the bush and um, how, do we, how, do we, how do we put this? Beating around the bush and jumping into conclusions. You know, there are people who only do those two exercises. You beat in around the bush and you jump into conclusions as the only exercise that you do. Do physical, whatever it is, walk, skip, whatever exercise it is, please exercise. And I've also learned that among those of us who live in urban centers and we don't expose our children to a physical activity, a lot of them are going down with depression because they don't feel like they have a purpose, they have a lot of latent energy, and they begin telling themselves stories and getting down in self-pity. Please, parents, have your teens, have your children physically active. Let them do something so that they can feel a sense of community, they can feel a sense of belonging. Don't think that if they remain home, they are reading, reading, matution, matution, our children are going down mentally. Let them be active. Let them join a, join a soccer club. You know, have somebody, get a coach somewhere to train these people to, to be active, to expand the energy. Another one is face your guilt and your shame. Face your guilt and your shame. If there's some guilt you have because of wrong choices that you have made in the past, don't bury under, uh, don't bury. Make sure you face them. You face that. You need to face that and ask for forgiveness and forgive yourself. Number six, take care of your physical health. That is diet, exercise. I think as Adventists, you know this one. You know this one. Take care because our physical mental health is inexplicably linked. There's no health without mental health. So be physically active. And as you're active, you actually release the feel-good hormones. So when you're feeling low, the last thing you should do is to go to bed and just lie in bed. Get out and walk, jump, you know, skip and do something like that. And then another one is carry out humanitarian services. Do something. Visit a children's home. Reach out and extend help. Because when we do something, when we do humanitarian services, it makes us feel good. And it makes us feel like we are adding value to humanity. Don't be like the Dead Sea. You're always just receiving, receiving, receiving. Also extend a hand and give. And by giving, I'm not saying material. I'm saying you can encourage somebody. You can say, you know, I'm praying for you. You know, I am with you. You are doing excellent. You're doing very well. May God bless you. You know, give, give something. The other one is keep a hopeful attitude. Always have hope. Always believe that things will get better. Don't let your tomorrow determine your future. Always know that things will work out for the good. The Bible says all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. So even when you don't see it working right now, it shall get better. It will work out. The other one is seek natural environments. Mental illnesses thrive in urban environments. Seek natural environment. Find a way of connecting with nature. Because mental illness, they thrive in concrete, tarmac, and cement. You get that? So if you live in a high rise, find a way of even coming here and just taking a walk and breathing in and out and, and, and just looking at the beautiful nature that God has created. Now, the last one that I want to share for today is that you need to bring the spiritual facet to your life. Music, meditating on the word of God, reading scripture. 
you know, even as I speak this, I always assume that you're Adventist and we have been singing from an early age, read your Bible, pray every day. So this I'm assuming you're already doing. So this is a very powerful component. Research has been done among people who are sick, chronically sick. They found out that those who had a belief in God, they actually recovered faster and better from their illness because they had this belief and they knew that all things are going to work together for the good of those who love the Lord and who are called according to his purpose. Now, I think I will uh, maybe share the strategies and end here. Strategies to help a mentally ill person. Suppose um, there is somebody maybe in the church, maybe in your family who is mentally ill. How do you respond? First of all, listen to the person without making any judgment and concentrate on their needs at the moment. Just listen. Listen, listen. Don't jump into conclusion and begin making judgments and telling them, you are making judgment. Who told you anafikiria sana? Just listen. Ask, would you like to talk about it? How do you feel now? You know, just listen, 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 listen. And then ask them what would help them. Avoid guesswork. Don't start guessing that, you know, I think what they need is this. Once you listen, ask, would you like to go for a walk? Do you think it would help? Can I give you some water? Would you like to have a meal? Would that help you? What would you like? Can I sit here? Would you like to talk? You know, just let them tell you what they would like. Don't guess as much as possible. I involve them. Now, the other one is reassure them. Reassure them that you will be there. Give practical information and resources. Avoid empty cliches. Avoid telling somebody empty cliches. Like now, avoid telling them it shall be well. What do you mean it shall be well? Don't tell them, I know you will recover. You don't know. They may recover, they may not. You don't know. I despise, I despise funerals where people like giving families of the bereaved, bereaved cliches that it shall be well. And then you're telling them, you know, God will not put on you what is more than you can, more than you can bear. He, he will, he can. The thing is, I told you, when Moses was having self-doubt, God never said, I'm going to remove this and it shall be well. God said, I will be with you. So just let them know, you know, just know that whatever you're going through, I'm here. I'm here for you. You can count on me. You can reach out to me. But again, as you say that, be sure you will actually be there for them. Don't start behaving like deputy or Jesus. Have you ever seen people like that? They start behaving like deputy or Jesus. And they're like telling you, you know, like they know the mind of God. You don't know. The thing is you don't know. You don't know. Don't say your tomorrow will be better, better than your today. How do you know? It may not. The thing is it may not be better, but the thing is I will be there. I will support you. I'm praying for you. You know? Don't say things that you don't know for sure. That's going to be the case. There is a time, um, I think I've shared this before, there was a young man who had cancer, throat cancer, so he was admitted at Kenyatta National Hospital. I was still very young. I was in training. So this lady came. She was a close, I think um, she was a member of the church that they went with this guy, and this lady was uh, a custodian in my university. She was in charge of, she was taking care of us in the hall we were staying in, in the university. So when she came, she found me, and then she started crying. She said, you see now, so-and-so is sick. And the lady was so broken, because this young man was a very close friend of her son. So it was like her son, so, and a member of their church, a very active youth in an SDA church in Nairobi. So the lady started crying and telling me now, so-and-so has been diagnosed with cancer. And it's interesting, because this young man had come on Saturday to minister to us in the university. Then during the week, we are told the, the gentleman who came to minister is admitted in ward so and so. I go to that ward, we find him, throat cancer. And this lady is there and she's crying. And you know, I made one of the mistakes that I learned from. She asked me this question, will he get well? You know, she was so desperate, she was looking for answers. Will he get well? And I said, yeah, yeah, he'll heal. He'll, he will get well, he'll be healed. My friend, the following week he had died. Diagnosed within a week, he had been struggling with some sore throat, what, what, they didn't know. 
he was diagnosed. The following week, he was dead. So we go to the ward when he's removed, and this lady breaks down. The moment she sees me, she says, and you lied to me. And you lied to me. You told me he's going to get well and he has died. You know, she was holding on to every word. So please, when you're visiting a sick person, never ever tell them you will get well. Do you know? You don't know. You don't know whether they'll get well. Just say, you know, I am here. I will pray for you. And let's trust the Lord. You know, we are trusting the Lord in everything because we don't know. So don't just throw empty words there that end up damaging and demoralizing and discouraging people because honestly you don't know and some people who know they look at you and they really despise what you're saying because you're just saying words which you don't mean or which you don't even understand so you can reassure people without throwing those empty cliches some of them you just pick from songs you know uh, out of context and you're just saying them you know if, if the song means something to you maybe you but don't just throw them at you because uh, you know no, don't throw those words at people. Avoid confrontation. Avoid confronting them. Like telling people, and you know I know, eh? You get sick because you think too much. You think too much. You know me, these things, eh? Don't confront. <laughs> you know some, you've not heard what some people tell people who are mentally unwell. kufikiria sana. What are you thinking about? You are not grateful. And the way you have... A family, you are not grateful. You know, don't con you don't know whether they are grateful or not. Okay, and then ask them if there is anybody they would like you to contact. Like you can just ask, is there anybody you would like to talk to? I can help you. If there is somebody that you would like, you would like to talk to. And if it's a family member, you know, living uh, dealing with a family member who is living with a mental illness is not easy. Many times everybody cares about the mentally ill person, but they don't care about their caregivers. Encourage the family member to reach additional support. You cannot be there all in all. They can get other support, like from a support group, from friends. Otherwise, if you want to be there all in all, you're going to be bedfellows. You will break down sooner or later, because as I said, you're not Christ. You're not the great burden bearer. There are other resources. It takes a community. It takes a village. Let them have other people. And then, even as they have other people, do not become codependent. Do not take charge of everything. Now you are the one taking charge. You are thinking for them. You are doing everything. Let them carry their share of life's burdens. That's how Ellen G. White puts it. Everybody shall carry their share of life's burdens. So don't be the one to tell them, umeoga. Umekula, ni kuongeze chakula. Encourage them. Food is ready. Should you want to eat? You know, the water, is, should you want to bathe? The water is ready. You know, something like that. So just encourage. Don't enable. Because the thing is, sometimes some people, sometimes some people, most of us, I think, we enjoy the attention that we may be getting, and sometimes it can deplete others. So you need to let even the sick person carry their share. And when they carry their share of life's burdens, they can make decisions you can assess. They can make decisions and what have you. It will even boost their esteem, and it makes them recover faster. And the same applies to if you're having a family member that is struggling with drug and substance abuse. Do not enable do not give them money. Do not uh, have a ready meal, hot meal when they are coming at midnight. You're cooking a meal for them. Like choices have consequences. So let them face the consequences. Don't give money. Because when you, as long as you keep giving them money, provide food, shelter, clothing, yes, but don't give them money. As long as you keep giving money, they will have a reason to keep going. To, to drink because they're having somebody that is enabling for them. Unfortunately, we have a lot of enabling behaviors. Parents, especially mothers, they enable their sons a lot. Some even go to the extent of marrying a wife for them. <laughs> Imagine, it's so sad and unfortunate. Imagine an Adventist. I had an Adventist woman the other day saying in church, telling youth, how sad. She was telling youth that I have a son who has left the church. The son is into drugs and alcohol. He has left the church. I want one of you girls to go and bring my son in the church. 
ati I want you to one of you to marry my son and bring him in the church. Wewe umeshindwa. Wewe ni mama umeshindwa kumleta kanisa. Imagine then you want someone's daughter. Is that even fair? You want someone's daughter to come to rescue your son as if that is possible. And she said it proudly. I told her no. I said this one I can't keep quiet. I told her no, 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 that's not fair. If it's your daughter being told that, that the son is drinking, smoking, addicted, atinataka, a very churchy and spiritual prayerful girl to bring my son from the Changa dance to church. We umeshindwa. Ulimza, ulimbeba, ukamza, ukamnyonyesha, ukambadlisha, ukamlisha, umeshindwa. And then you are expecting somebody's daughter to do such a thing. So their parents, they go, I've seen many, especially mothers, they get wives for their sons. And they will get the wife who seems to be well put together to s rescue their son. Imagine. And they even go, they support her. You know, they get children. The mother takes over. Selfish. Selfish. They're just looking at their own interests. Instead of holding the son accountable so that if he needs to go to rehab, I end it. Before they can let him inflict himself on somebody's daughter. <laughs>